Uh, welcome to the NSA tent. Uh, this afternoon, uh, for the next hour, we're going to have our panelists talk to us a little bit about um, a force for social good in the sheep industry. And, of course, sheep farming has been around for centuries thousands of years in fact and those grazing animals as we well know uh, have shaped the landscape particularly the hills and the mountains and the fells and the people look look after those animals um, play a very important role in the social uh, rural domain financially and socially of course so those families and the spider's web of industry that support them um, have a huge impact on those rural areas and it adds up to millions and millions of pounds. And unfortunately, there is quite a lot of news or noise um, with a sort of negative flow towards some grazing animals. And the sheep industry is an incredible industry and we produce an amazing product. And if you've been to some of the sessions today, you'd have heard people talking about the amazing products we produce in this country and also the amazing legislation we have that manages our waste, our inputs, our employment law, uh, our animal welfare, that some farmers might complain that the legislation is too tight. But actually, we need to get on our soapboxes and shout about how good that is and celebrate that and then market it. And we also need to persuade government, our policymakers, um, that that rural landscape is something that needs protecting, it's something that Prince Charles has been banging on about for many, many years. And it's time for us as an industry to uh, do more and talk about it more and shout about it more and celebrate it more. Um, because without the people managing the sheep across the country, but particularly in the hills and the fells and the mountains, those villages and towns will become denuded uh, socially, but also financially. So an incredibly important topic, and we've got some great people with us today um, to talk us through it. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Matt Lobley, who's from Exeter University. So Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then uh, let's hear your presentation. Thank you. Right, so hi everybody. Hopefully you can hear. I hate sitting down when I'm performing, so I'm going to stand up. I hope this works. So yeah, my name is Matt Lobley. I'm um, director of the Centre for Rural Policy Research at the University of Exeter, which is not far from where that photo was taken. Anyone recognise what that is? Where that is? It's Dartmoor. I'm, now, there might be a bit of a Dartmoor theme in my presentation. Um, look, I'm a social scientist, so I'm interested in people. I'm interested in what they do, why they do it. And the people I'm really interested in is farmers. And I've been studying farmers for 30 odd years, trying to work out why they do the things they do. I still don't understand, I'm still working on it. And neither do we. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Social dimension of sheep farming. So like I said, I'm interested in people. So this was written a few years ago by David Thurston. Some of you may have heard of David Thurston, does a lot of work, uh, led an inquiry about future farming. And he says, you know, when someone visits a farm, they will look at what's important to them. Everybody will look at different things. I am normally interested in the people. It is largely up to them whether or not it succeeds. And that's pretty much my, my approach as well. It's all about the people. So I'm going to start off with some less good things about people and work on through to some better things. So I'm going to have to say some stuff about health, well-being and disconnection between farmers and non-farming people. Right? You're here as farmers. You're key workers. Right? We all rely on you at least three times a day. Some of us sometimes more if we can fit it in. Um, and yet you operate in a sector that's well known for high rates of suicide, fatal and non-fatal accidents. It's not always the best place to be working. Our research that we've done uh, last year, funded by RABI and work with our colleagues at FCN, we identified really high rates of depression in the farming industry, higher than national averages. High rates of anxiety. But those rates were even higher on farms where there was livestock, particularly beef and sheep and pigs. Pigs was really bad. And also on smaller farms. And this is for a whole load of different reasons. But we need to recognise this and we need to talk about it. And we need to work out what we can do. Because people are suffering from stress, whether it's the regulatory burden, whether it's the agricultural transition. I saw the DEFRA stand was very busy over there earlier. People are often very lonely in farming. 
You're often working on your own, maybe feeling isolated from the rest of the community. Right, this is not a rural urban thing, it's a farming, non-farming thing. There's a disconnection, often. A lot of farmers we talk to say, nobody wants us, nobody understands us, nobody values us. So we need to do something about that. People will often say, we've got to educate the public. Well, what you need to do is have a dialogue, a two-way conversation. So the public understand you and you understand the public. So that was the, that's the negative bit, right? Just got to say it. We, we've got to do something about the mental health issues in farming. And it's not just blokes, okay? We identified young women coming out worst on most of the measures that we had about mental health. Okay, there's been a lot of talk about the future of farming, and some of it's going on here. And there were concerns about what might happen if farmers leave the land. Now, I said I've been working with farmers for a long time, I know, you know, you don't just get up and go. But the harsh truth is, right, and it is a harsh truth, we could probably produce existing levels of food with fewer than the existing number of farmers. But what about the environment? What about rural communities if suddenly we don't have so many farmers? Society general, rural culture, what would happen to it if we suddenly lose lots of our farmers? So there's this, it's very easy to get the idea that farm size has been increasing forever and always churning. Well actually, up until the 1940s or 50s, farm sizes had been pretty level for a long, long time. It's only in that post-war period you suddenly get this rapid change and the loss of smaller farms and farms getting bigger and bigger. And the thing is, when you lose small family farms, like you guys, you have fewer people on the land. You have fewer people around to play a formal or informal role in their communities. Who is it that's out there in the lane with a chainsaw when a tree's come down overnight, first thing in the morning? Who is it dra dragging firewood to the bonfire for November 5th? All these different things. And also we have evidence that small family farms support a greater density of employment. They employ more workers per unit area than larger farms. So these are really valuable for all sorts of reasons. So further declines in the number of small farms would probably mean fewer local suppliers and fewer local suppliers of services. What it means for the environment, though, is really complex because it really depends who comes next. But, another nice bit of Dartmoor, okay. Now, some people would say that landscape is sheep wrecked. I'm not naming any names, right? But you can detect you know, a really tightly grazed short sward there. What you can also see is the granite, granite tramway on Dartmoor, right? This was hacked out of granite pre-railway age and laid across Dartmoor. It's got junctions, points, it's absolutely amazing. It's a World Heritage Site. We need sheep grazing for you to be able to see that. And that's part of our cultural heritage. So sheep farming is supporting our environmental and our cultural heritage. We need to shout about that a bit more. Here's another one. Stone Circle, kept open thanks to sheep grazing on Dartmoor. So I know there are other up upland areas, but Dartmoor's you know, just down the road, it's my favorite. I'm just gonna say something very, very briefly about family farming and new blood, and then I'm gonna hand over, and I know someone else is gonna talk more about succession. When I've done all that work for three and a bit decades on farming, a lot of it has been about succession. So I could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about that with you, but I'm not going to. But high rates of succession are testament to the tenacity and persistence of farming families. People have been predicting the end of family farming for years and years and years, and yet you're still all here because you persist. So this quote there, that's from um, a farmer that I interviewed a few years ago, female farmer actually, she said, and it, I just thought it was great, I think farmers are hefted onto the land and we don't transplant very easily. And it really kind of summed it up to me, that you know, belonging on that piece of land. And that's really important, because that kind of repeated transfer of farms down the generations of same families in a particular locality results in farming families that are deeply, deeply socially embedded in their communities. 
they're committed to that place. And so there's lots and lots to be valued and cherished in all of that. And we should be helping you go through that process of handing down the farm. On the other hand, we also need to get some new blood into the industry. Agriculture, again, for decades has had characteristics of a closed shop. You only really get into farming if you come from a farming family. We need to shake that up a bit. We need to encourage new people to come in, younger people with different ideas, different skill sets. Yeah, they might do things differently to the way you've done it, but let's give them a go because that new blood can give a really important injection of new ideas. And sheep farming can be a good opportunity for new entrants compared to some of the other sectors. But I, I did some work a few years ago with young, young sheep farmers on Exmoor, so just to prove I do know about other upland areas. Um, they were really keen. They were really keen about farming. They were held back because it was so difficult to access land. Some of them just had it on annual grazing licenses and they didn't know how much they were going to have from one year to the next. So we need to do something about giving young people access to land. So I've rattled through that really quickly because I know we don't have long and I've got other speakers. I thought I would put a gratuitous picture of a Herdwick there because I'm pretty sure someone's going to like that. And I'm going to leave it there and we'll have questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, great introduction to the session this afternoon. Um, our next speaker is Carol Hughes. Now, uh, Carol is an NSA Next Generation Ambassador and Sheep Farmer in Wales and um, took on a farm as a youngster um, as part of a um, National Trust uh, property. And uh, we filmed with her on Country Farm and uh, is a great ambassador for young people getting into sheep farming. Carol. Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, my name is Carol Hughes. So we, I'm now currently farming um, in North East Wales with my parents. So I will be the fifth generation to farm at uh, Tuntaravon in Tanaramon. Um, but yeah, really from the off, I probably, a bit of a tomboy, loved being outside. Um, didn't really like the dress situation or going out shopping with mum or anything. So from the off, really, I was always a bit of a tomboy. I've got a young, younger brother who's five years younger and he had the same sentiment as me, really. Um, so yeah, I went to, to a sort of an urban school, um, very towny based, um, and agriculture really wasn't on the, the, the playing field for, for careers after leaving school really. So I, I stayed in did A-levels um, in, in sixth form, um, had big plans on being a vet, um, but that's when Young Farmer stepped into my life and uh, I kind of took more of a, a stream maybe towards doing more with that, learning more things that in hindsight now are probably more important than do my A-levels, um, like public speaking and that kind of thing. So um, I went down that avenue, um, decided not to pursue, I did my A-levels, but decided not to p pursue too much of a career and went into um, Aberystwyth University uh, to study agriculture and animal science, which in hindsight was the best thing I ever did ever. Um, I think it's for stress levels on myself, it was, it was much more of a, um, a career, you know, a, a much more of a course that I enjoyed and I could see a lot more out of it at the end. Um, so during my time at Aberystwyth University, um, I got a chance to go um, to New Zealand. Um, I kind of looked over there, looked at dairy farming over there. It's kind of system I hadn't really, um, I didn't really know much about really, being, being an upland beef and sheep farmer. Um, I hadn't really looked much at dairy, so I thought we'll go to New Zealand and see what they've got to, got to say over there. And while I was there, I did get a chance to do a bit of, um, um, go onto a sheep station as well and look at that. Um, so came home again, uh, mum and dad are here somewhere, there he is. He's not. They're not quite going grey yet, so they weren't, when I came home from uni, they weren't quite ready for me to come home, maybe as such. Um, so I took a couple of years, really, just to sort of find what I wanted to do, experience different things, and that's where the Sunday East South Scholarship um, came up with the National Trust and Wales YFC. Um, so for those of you who, didn't, who haven't, heard of, haven't heard before, it's, it was a 500-acre farm in the middle of Snowdonia in Beth Gellet, and basically they give you the keys to the farm gate as such for 12 months. So I was really lucky. I was the, the first one to do it, the, the guinea pig kind of thing for the scheme. Um, so I had the opportunity to go out and actually buy a flock back for the farm um, and yeah, buy some cattle and sort of set the farm up again um, as I wanted it really. Um, so yeah, that's where Adam came over and visited a couple of times just to see how I was getting on. Um, so that was a great experience in itself. Working for, a, working for the National Trust was, was definitely an experience and, and opened my eyes really to, to different things and different parts of the farm that I maybe hadn't considered before. Um, so after that, I finished my 12 months placement there. Um, again, 
still wasn't ready to come home, so I did a bit of travelling, worked for the people, did a bit of contract shepherding, um, went to Norway for a bit as well, and um, did some studying in, Fr in uh, France on, um, on hefting flocks up on the Alps as well. Um, and then, yeah, there was a tenancy um, of quite a big farm near us, about four miles down the road, um, came up for lease, really. Um, the, the landlord himself wanted to split it up into different, different packages. So um, I was really interested to try. I was never going to get 300 acres four miles from home, I think, ever. So we thought, right, we'll grab the ball by the horns and we'll try for it. But obviously, in my current situation, I didn't have a lot of um, money behind me at the time and obviously that kind of size farm you need a lot of money to take on the rent and a lot of money as well to stock it because there was no stock going to be with the farm and um, so I was lucky enough that opportunity ar arose at home that I could join the family partnership so I had some sort of um, backing with me for this farm lucky enough to uh, take over the farm and now we farm it in partnership with my parents now and my grandmother um, to it sort of runs the business as, as a whole really but the, the two farms are separate um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I am. I am now really. Um, I said I did the next generation in 2017. It opened my eyes to a different farming across across different sheep farming across the country really. Um, but yeah, so for me, I'm quite uh, quite passionate about young farmers, as you've probably heard. And um, Welsh language and traditions really are quite important to me. And I think that's something where the sheep industry, definitely in the uplands of Wales, is vitally important. I think there's a lot of things we can lose if we're not careful if we don't look after those different different things really so yeah thank you very much inspirational <laughs> and now we have a, a guest from the Isle of Man uh, Kiri is going to tell us about her life in the Isle of Man and, and farming there okay hi everybody I'm Kiri from the Isle of Man um, so same as Karis, I'm a fifth generation farmer. I left school at 16. I really didn't know what I wanted to do other than farm, to be quite honest. So I joined the family business and we have our home farm, which we own uh, 120 acres. And then we rent a, a further thousand acres of mostly lowland. We have beef and sheep farm. Uh, beef would be Aberdeen Angus cows with limbs and bull over them with a few pedigree limbs alongside and the sheep would be mostly crossbreds with a few charolais and a flock of texels which we come over here and do some of the shows and national sales with but sell and sheel and rams locally on the island and um, then five years ago we decided to diversify our old redundant stone buildings into holiday cottages so we now have seven of them and i think they are more hard work than the whole entire farm uh, making beds really isn't easy so yeah whoever thought that was a yeah bright spark but and um, more lately, I took on a role with, as a procurement officer at Isle of Man Meats, which is the only abattoir on the island, sourcing lambs and liaising with the farmers. Um, farmers are tricky people and there was an awful lot of unrest before um, I joined and hopefully now uh, we got them sort of quietened off a bit. But price always helps and uh, the price of lamb has been quite good this year. So yeah, it's made my job a bit easier. Um, with that, with Isle of Man Meat Company, I think we have to tell our own story uh, as farmers, beef, lamb, pork producers. Um, we try and get out to shows and events, taking part in like the Great Taste Awards, British Food Awards, those sort of things to basically, um, if you can gain stars at the Great Taste Awards, it's recognition for the farmers back home doing all of the work. So I see those as quite good parts of advertisement. Um, education, I think, in agriculture is absolutely paramount from, for every level, for every person. It should be in the national curriculum. I go about the schools trying to talk about the meat plant. Um, the question and answer part of that is always interesting. They want to know, is it a man that runs around with an axe in the, in the abattoir? Is that how it works? These are questions that you know, they don't have the answers to. So until we tell our story, um, they're not really going to understand what we do. Um, and with that food security through um, COVID-19, we live on an island, we heavily rely on the ferry to come in and go out. Um, it really reiterated how important our island's farmers were at that time. So um, we have 13 butchers shops on the island and a couple of superstores being Tesco on the co-op. Tesco have been a really, really good support to the island's farmers in the last two years. They've taken beef and lamb and in the coming months be taken pork. So they've really supported the island. Um, same as Karis from the Next Generation uh, Young Ambassador Scheme was really, really good in a great way for young people to reach out and meet other people and learn. And same with the breed societies, the Texels and the Limousins. They were two organisations that I learned a lot from, stock judging and different things that have helped. 
Um, so I do think that education and the backstory of what we do needs to be told a lot more. I think farmers do a great job, they do all the hard work, but are so terrible poor at telling the story. So I think that's the area that we really need to concentrate and work on and get it out to the masses. Um, it, it's a great industry be, to be in and yeah, food security is going to be key going forward, I'd say. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, our next speaker is Rollo Deutsch, and he has um, stood in for someone who couldn't turn up. So um, Rollo has been dropped into the deep end, but is um, a very well-known local uh, sheep farmer who is a self-starter and runs his own shearing gang and very highly regarded in the, um, in the local sheep industry here. So uh, Rollo, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, I'm uh, afraid I haven't got many notes, but um, I'm from uh, Chipping Camden, Gloucestershire, not far away. And... Uh, yeah, I just started on my own really. Uh, I was lucky enough to live in a rural area, um, growing up around farming. Um, my mother's side of the family, they farmed in Wiltshire. So um, yeah, I was always obsessed with farming and it's all I ever wanted to do really. So from then on, um, I think my grandmother gave me two sheep for my birthday and um, I gradually, uh, I had an orchard at home. I was lucky enough to live at home. so. They lived there for a bit and then I gradually built it up and got to uh, 30 pedigrees which I used to show and go around the country showing. Um, and yeah, I, I, I ran out of grass eventually. I went to a local farmer and he kindly sublet a field to me. So it was only a small field but it, it got me going. And over the road was um, a woman who, she had a few pony paddocks and she said, would you like some extra summer keep? So um, the sheep, yeah, they ran over the road quite frequently. And um, yeah, she happened to be a land agent of a estate locally um, next door. And she rang up one day out of the blue and said, the old boy on the hill is 60 acres and he's giving up. Um, at this stage, I was at Hartbury doing a three year course and the middle year you did on work experience um, on one farm. And uh, yeah, that was probably one of the best things I did. I met a lot of people going from school where no one's really interested in farming. I met a lot of uh, like-minded people. So um, of course I said yes to this 60 acres. And uh, yeah, she was about to ring the farmer next door and I told her not to, I definitely have it. So at the time I was at Hartbury and I decided to try and do Hartbury. I, I'd run new lambs, run them for a year and then sell them on again. But uh, yeah, the trouble was I didn't have any money to do it with. So I had to go and buy them. Um, I bought them privately, probably from three different places, 300 ewe lambs. Um, I went and saw the bank and uh, the bank, they can believe it, 16 year old, 17 year old, there's no way you're gonna get a loan. So um, yeah, I approached two different, I called it, yeah, I told them it would be an investment. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they came in, uh, they did want, uh, yeah, they, they wanted a certain percent back and uh, it took me quite a few years to pay it off, probably four, four to five years, but they're very kind family, friends and um, yeah, th that got me going really. And then, um, I'm telling you the whole story here, it's a bit wind long winded, but um, yeah, so then I eventually was going to leave Hartbury and I decided to, I wouldn't sell the ewe lambs this one year, I'd lamb them all. So I lambed them. Um, and luckily at the same time, the same estate that had the 60 acres said, would you like to take some more on? So it was quite a good stepping stone. So I took more on, and this was just one landlord at the time, and I rented little bits of paddocks here and there, traveling about everywhere. Um, and yeah, it just carried on like that really. Um, and then Hartbury, I don't know, I like to get it right. So they offered me a scholarship in the end to go to Sarancester. Um, which I thought I've got to do it, even though I had these sheep at home and I started sheep shearing and working for a contractor. Um, so I went to Sarancester and uh, I think I did about three months there. Um, I felt rather bad really, because I obviously got a scholarship to go there, but it just, it wasn't for me really. And um, I thought if I'm going to do this properly, I'm going to, I've got the opportunity to go home and do it. So um, that's what I did. Uh, yeah, I've gradually built it up over the years. Um, I land nine, yeah, 960 now. Um, there's two breeds of sheep 
because the, the land ranges from uh, some nearly at a thousand feet and it drops right back down so the stuff on tops uh, like Cotswold brash hardly any soil and the stuff down below it's sort of heavy clay so I decided you know you can't you have one sort of sheet that will fit all systems always so um, yeah I run a Texel mule or North Country mule on the, on the lower ground and a Cheviot mule on the higher ground um, I've started sort of breeding my own replacements just to cut the cost a bit um, and yeah that's how it goes there's four different landlords everything's on 11 month tenancy agreements um, there's a shed in the village that I rent for lambing time in April I can fit about 200 ewes in the shed 180 so I try and get all the triplets in and the singles and then um, yeah all the every every double lambs outside in sort of bunches of 80 there might be I don't know, 10 bunches or eight bunches so um, I'm doing a lot of traveling and driving um, and yeah the costs are obviously increasing at the moment but um, it's still going well and equipment's one of my downfalls probably all my equipment's quite old when I started out it was all second hand so I'm just looking at investing in that really um, and yeah just built, built it up over the years and keep going there's a lot of people who have helped me along the way um, other farmers no end and the shearing that pays my rent that got me going in the first place um, so I shear all, all spring and then um, yeah then get my head down and they lamb in April so yeah everything goes on to roots or arable farmers ground in the winter um, dairy farms in the autumn um, and it works quite well you've got to make it suit your lifestyle really um, you get bad days you get good days but um, I also did the Young Ambassadors course um, that was one of the best things I ever did the stuff I learned there and the people you met and it wasn't all to do with sheep farming just general life things you learn so um, yeah that was great um, oh after that they the Farmers Weekly came out and tried to do an article and uh, I thought it wasn't going to happen because it didn't come out for ages I was rather relieved and then suddenly it came out in the spring just before we were going to go shearing and I thought it was the worst thing I'd ever done because every place we went shearing you just yeah everyone said here he is here he is again in the Farmers Weekly <laughs> and uh, yeah so um, but yeah I went to see the bank a second time after that and um, the woman it took me four meetings and she wouldn't you could see she wasn't taking me seriously so um, in the end I took the Farmers Weekly with me and I threw it down in front of her and I said uh, this is my business here it is and if you don't understand what I'm saying now take it or leave it sort of thing and she loved that of course so um, I don't regret being in Farmers Weekly but uh, it did help in the end <laughs> yeah so um, yeah that's me really and uh, going forward to the future I, I have thought about increasing because I've been lucky enough to be in an area where the land's been available on these estates where they can't plough up the permanent pasture um, but yeah I'm not so sure it's always the best thing to do because you're stretching yourself um, and you're employing someone and whether it's just better to have a steady number so um, my next plan is to perhaps go and see, an, go and see an, a, a consultant and uh, have a good think about what goes on next but um, it works at the moment and I can't think I'll be doing anything else so um, that's all I know yeah Thank you very much to all of our um, speakers. We've heard the background, um, we've heard about the importance and the difficulties perhaps and some of the challenges in sheep farming sector and uh, the agricultural sector perhaps as a whole. Um, but also then three inspirational speakers telling us about the amazing lives they lead uh, working with livestock and particularly sheep and how um, young people have made their way in, in the world of sheep farming and love it and are an important part of our industry as ambassadors and leaders but also uh, the future um, for sheep farming but also that rural domain and how important that is. So we'll now throw this open to the floor and um, please ask any of us any questions you'd like to um, and you don't necessarily have to stick to the theme if you don't want to but um, it, the idea is that uh, we're talking about the importance of the social structure of sheep farming in the countryside and um, we've got a, a, a um, 
microphone going around, so do put your hands up if you've got anything you'd like to ask. There's a gentleman down the front here first, should we go? I mean, if you could wait for the microphone, because otherwise the people in this side of the room won't be able to hear, and neither will I. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And thank you all very much for your uh, presentation. It's all very good, very interesting. And I, I went to the, I think it was the NFU or the Oxford Conference, I can't remember, about a decade ago, and David Yellen, who used to be editor of The Sun, stood up and presented uh, a survey. And th th this, uh, the survey was of public perception and trust. And that survey has been repeated a number of times since. And every time, firemen, nurses, doctors, farmers. We're always near the top of that list. Every time we, we've got a trust level that's the, the envy of every, most every other profession, you know, politicians and estate <laughs> agents and people like that. So, so we've got that trust. <laughs> and yet you talk about it and we know about it, the disconnect. We all operate in our own little echo chambers, you know, Carice talking about going out to schools and, and all that sort of stuff. And Adam does his work in the media and that's all really good. But we do have that disconnect. And I, I can never quite join the dots. Why is there that trust level and yet there's still that disconnection? And I, it's maybe from a social aspect you could help me with that, but I've, I've always wondered why that, why that is. Yeah, I wish I knew the answer, really, because uh, it's a really good question. We always point this out. So when we're talking to farmers and they say to us, nobody wants us, nobody understands us, and everyone hates us, climate change, whatever. And we say that. We say, but there's really high levels of public trust. And, and it is just this disconnect that people don't go onto farms. So yeah, well, there's great things like Open Farm Sunday, but that's you know one Sunday once a year. Most people have no idea where their food comes from. They really don't understand. You know, and I, for a long time, I thought it was an urban myth that you know, school children didn't know that milk came from cows. But I've talked to enough farmers that have had school visits around, and they say they don't. So it, and it goes, I think it was your point about education, yeah, it goes right back to the early days when people are growing up, they need to understand where their food comes from, and that there's these people called farmers who work, you know, 80 hours a week or, po or probably more 80 hours is probably a short week for this guy um, you know for, for not a great financial return but it puts food on our tables and so I think we need we need to do more things to, to break break down the barriers to build the connection so things like you know there are certain TV programs aren't there that help with that so I think we need more of that I and mean, we need more farmers who will get out there and talk as well and it's not always easy and, and when you're working really hard it's not always easy either but opening up so less of that you know get off my land stuff and more get on my land would you I like think, to comment sorry, i think i think for me oh, it'd be interesting to find out of that survey how many people in the previous year had either been digged out of snow by a farmer or had a tree pulled off their road by a farmer because i think that until they need a farmer you know it's just like well the food's there the food's in the supermarket isn't it so i think it'd be quite interesting if that survey actually if there's a section they could probably fill in somewhere and say have you been rescued by a farmer in the last 12 months and if the answer was yes has that then tainted how they feel how that trust because it is like an emergency service isn't it you know when there's you've got to go to work or the the, 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 la the phone line is down or the electric cable's down and a tree's over it it's, it's kind of what farmers do is kind of emergency isn't it so i think uh like the covid times that obviously brought it home big time to most of the general public didn't it and they actually thought about where their food was coming from and they went to farm shops and used farm shops a lot more didn't they so they're obviously thinking and it's it's there but it's getting them to think about it really I fully agree with you, Rollo. Yeah, it's since COVID they've realised that we're here, but there's been a huge gap. There's a couple of generations. I know when I was at high school all those moons ago, there was the end of rural science. So there's maybe 20 years worth there of um, no education whatsoever. I think it has to come into the curriculum from year one upwards. Every week there should be a lesson to do with food. You know, not necessarily farming, but food and production, how it's grown or where it's grown. Because the, the same as Matt said, there's a child here today that thought uh, sausages, um, pigs laid sausages. It's the most ridiculous thing, but they're so genuine. They really, really are. And you hear these stories all the time. And when you get in with them, they, have, they open up and they ask the questions. And I do think that every school, like you've been trying to, you know, to say in the national curriculum, it, it should be there, it should be in black and white. And also for older people as well, you know, refresher and all the rest of it. So yeah, for sure. I'll just make a quick comment. I think it's very warming that the general public as a whole um, have us up there, uh, you know, as a list of people who have got honesty and integrity. And I think that's a word that's been used a lot lately in the press. And I think it's something that we need to continue to um, use to our strength. And we need to continue to be honest and integral. And there are sometimes spats in the countryside and social media about 
what farming delivers and, and we need to manage those conversations really carefully and really well and um, education I think is absolutely um, key and, and, it, and it, it's going to be a long time before we can get agriculture back into the national curriculum either as a topic itself or as in lots of topics but what we can do as an industry is, is communicate well and professionally and positively and we all have that amazing thing social media um, some are better at it than others um, but we can all use that now to our strength um, and of course we need to defend ourselves but I think we need to do it in a sensible way we, we can't be log ahead about it it has to be done very sensitively because as we heard from Rollo you know we, we've got people going into farm shops during COVID and realizing that food security was a problem and we produce great food in this country but they've very quickly gone back to the zoo market now um, lots of people want to have milk delivered to their door and now they're not and and so th we need to hook on to the consumer whilst we have the opportunity and that is got to be from all of us and we can't sit on our laurels watching country files thinking well they're not doing enough they're a bit fluffy around the edges they're not you know they're not shouting about enough well so what G you know get off your backsides and do it yourself you know you we all have to do it be out there shouting about it really really important so it's going to be the, the life or death of our industry in the middle here i just wait for you to come um the microphone please Following on from what you've just said, um, my partner farms in Powys and we are part of an organisation or we're involved with an organisation called the Black Mountain Land Use Partnership, part of which is chaired by our very own Phil Stocker. <clears throat> part of what they do is um, run education courses and visit schools with the children. They also liaise quite closely, well, as part of the partnership involves um, various outside organisations, the National Parks, Welsh Water, etc, etc, etc. And I was wondering how you felt about the importance of farmers liaising with these groups and, and the, as well as the general public in order to increase an awareness of not only the work they do but also the problems they encounter and the help they could do with and also the help they can provide people with. So do you all believe that there is a real role that these sorts of um, tie-ins can do to benefit not only the organisations that they're tying in with but also the farmers themselves? Uh, yes, from me. Yeah, fully agree, absolutely. It needs to come from everybody, from the societies, the associations, teachers, family, friends. I know even my school friends, we will talk about farming and, and they oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know this, and hopefully they'll take that and tell somebody else. It's that trickle-down effect, and uh, yeah, the more people that will you know, share the story, the better, and especially um, associations like those, for sure. Yeah, I think we, um, I was lucky to be involved in a, the last, well, before COVID and again now since, um, with um, and from you've heard from Wales, the cows on tour group. They join they joined in uh, with NFU and the FEW, and they actually went out into the schools um, in the nearest towns to them. So literally, they took a dairy cow, they took some sheep. Um, my dad and I cheered the de demonstration on wool wrapping and shearing. You know where wool comes from. They were making. Um, butter out of milk by shaking it up and they're singing a song and shaking it. They, were, they had chickens there and they just generally took, it was in Plaskork in Wrexham and they took the farm to the school. The school lucky had a big, so a big playing field and they took everything to the school and dropped it there in front of them. I mean, the teachers loved it because they had an afternoon off teaching, which they all really, really <laughs> desperately wanted, I think. But it was surprising how many questions they had as well. And, and they're the ones that are educating these children. You know, and they had a lot, of, a lot of serious questions and a lot of weird comments sometimes as well themselves they didn't know. And, you know, sometimes the kids knew more than them. You know, we asked simple questions, you know, about, you know, well, to me it's simple but maybe to them it wasn't you know about how many how many sheep are, uh, how many teeth a sheep has and is it on top of the bottom and, you know and what does a sheep eat and then you know and that kind of thing and it was really simple stuff but it doesn't really get touched upon at all um and i think like feedback from that day uh, in that school you know the, the parents are coming to fetch their kids at quarter past three and the parents we had to carry on going because the parents came back in they'd gone to the school gate and the kids had said well look mum come on come in here look there's a there's a man shearing a sheep there's there's a cow being milked and there's some lambs there and, and it was it was it was mad that there was that many children that many parents sort of kept, we had to carry on the session because it just well it took over really but it's it's having time to do that it took a lot of time a lot of resources a lot of paperwork i'd imagine to get that livestock into that field uh, and everything and yeah i mean to me that was the that was the crux of it really that was getting to the to the children that needed it they were in the middle of wrexham um a few of them maybe had a link to agriculture but but none at all really and that you know, from that, I'd like to think that a lot of them went home and actually thought a bit more about where that milk and that carton came from, you know, where that piece of meat came from, I think. So, yeah, I think there's a lot, 
a lot to be done, like, like Adam said, a lot to be done on the farmer side, but a lot to be done from the partnerships as well in jumping out and, and actually having, I don't know, grabbing the ball by the horns maybe and just going out there and approaching your schools and, and trying to get involved in them, really. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is it's all very well being in the public eye at big events and things like that, but the general public see you, you know, they might not see a farmer every day and when you're working or you're at the time in the day where you're getting sheep in or something, then I think it's quite important that what Joe Bloggs sees you as when you're doing that, it, it's, uh, it's a nice view for them or, you know, I know what it can be like, the sheep get out and you're running down the road shouting at the car because it won't stop or that sort of thing. It only needs one person to go, go home and tell 10 other people, oh, that, uh, I don't like the look of farming, that chap, he's, he's, he's a bit, you know, he's, he's not quite right. So that sort of, uh, <laughs> I think that sort of uh, perspective is quite important as well because that's an everyday thing that we can all do. Or, you know, you've got a dead you or something and its legs are sticking out the truck. Something like that is not so good to be showing the public. So as a farmer, I think we have to think every day of who might be watching you or, you know, what might be said. Another question over here. Thank you, Adam, and, and thank you to all the panellists. My name is Jude McCann. I work for the Farming Community Network, a charity supporting farmers across England and Wales. I want to pick up on a point that Matt um, mentioned at the very beginning around the poor mental health within the farming community. I want, I want to ask the younger panellists, what do you think we as an industry need to be doing to be more proactive in supporting mental health um, among young farmers, but also older farmers? Should we start on this end? Kerry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do think that with social media and the connection generally now is so much better. We all have Facebook or whatever or a, or a smartphone that we can maybe chat to friends and whatever else. But like you say, it is still a lonely industry and that is the problem we've got. You know, a lot, lot more mechanised now. You know, one man instead of five people. Yeah, I remember generations ago our pictures that we have in our house is lots of people working on the farm and the land and the neighbours would come together. Now that is very, very different now. It, you know, it is a very lonely industry. But I think um, like there's good work getting done around the countryside. There's, people are saying you know, there's, there's helplines, there's charities, we're here to help. Um, it is just hoping that that person can reach out. But for us to all check in on our neighbours, I think is, is really, really uh, important. It takes two seconds to write a text, you know, how are you doing today or whatever. And it's as much our responsibility to see how they are as they are to reach out to us if they're not feeling so great. But I think it is a little bit better now with, with social media but that has, um, has its negatives as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I probably agree with everything Kiri said, really. Um, but as well for me, it's, it's the pressures of the industry from legislation and government above as well. Um, there's a lot, a, a lot of pressure, I'd say, on that. Um, but yeah, just, I think when the, well, for me, it's more like TB is, a, is a quite a big issue. And that's, there's sometimes it can be, yeah, I'm not saying they need to go soft at us and, and let us do what we want and everything, but I think it's how it's done and how it's directed to us as well sometimes. It's kind of a bit um, targeted that if this isn't done, you're losing this, bang, 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 end of. There's no, there's no kind of halfway, there's no kind of conversation about it. It's very, in my opinion, it's very abrupt, abrupt anyway. And I think that's something that, you know, when we do talk to people and government officials and, and people setting legislation that that needs to be kind of reminded that we are human and yes it doesn't matter how you know how much damage it's done we know we've, we're not trying to do it on purpose it's usually accidental but you know there's there's things it's it's not just affecting our business it's affecting our mental health as well and i think that's something that really needs to be hammered home when we are like going, you know going ahead now there's a lot of things going to change a lot of legislation going to change um a lot of positives going to come out of it but also a lot of hardship as well is going to come and i think that's when we need to just remind these people that we are just human as well um and you know like it's yeah it's a way of life as a way of life but it's our businesses and it's yeah it's affecting a lot of people probably yes yeah i think as a farmer it's very easy to just shut yourself away um for instance lambing time it's quite easy just to get on with your job but not see anyone for weeks so yeah it's important to keep talking to each other um and see how see how people are um for instance if you had abortion at lambing you're you're down in the dumps a bit and um 
you don't really want to ring anyone because you don't really want to let too many people know you've got abortion. So it's quite easy to get in that rut. Um, and yeah, it's, it's important to get out a bit as well, I think. Um, I'm lucky enough to live at home, so I'm always seeing people, but I can imagine what it's like if you live on your own and you're trying to run your own, own farm. Um, I've got a friend like it, and um, you just have to keep ringing each other and talking. Or I'm lucky enough to have a good local pub as well where other <laughs> farmers meet, so it's good to go there. And you explain your problems you, you had yesterday or today, and yeah, I had problems yesterday, so yeah, you call in for a quick one and you put the world to, to rest, can't you? Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is such a big area. Um, and Jude, you know what I think, but I'll just share some of my thoughts. And, and you've all said really, really good things. Having social support is really, really important. Right? In all studies of mental health, not just in farming, having social support, social buffer, people you can talk to, people who are interested, genuinely interested in your well-being, that's really important. Our research showed that getting off the farm was one of the most important things associated with people who have better levels of mental health and well-being. And again, yeah, it's not always easy, sure, but we need to normalise getting off the farm. You know, farmers, no disrespect to any of you, you know, you wear it like a badge of honour, I've been working 80 hours a week on this tractor and, you know, well, perhaps we should start thinking differently because that's not necessarily good for everybody. Some people can do it, not everybody, it's not a problem. We all have health, right? We all have physical health, we all have mental health, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's less good. So we've got to talk about it and we've got to genuinely reach out to people and ask. And the other thing is, in our research, and you won't be surprised, regulation, compliance and inspection came out as the highest cause of stress for many, many farmers. And it's precisely because of the kind of things you're saying, people coming onto your farm that have the power to cost you a lot of money and they don't necessarily understand you as farmers, your way of life, what you're doing. So one of our recommendations is everybody who goes onto a farm in an official capacity needs to have some background in understanding mental health issues, be able to signpost to help and be able to treat people like human beings with a bit of respect. I think there's some really good advice there, isn't there? But if you could help out with FCN and RABI and, you know, DPJ and all those, all those other foundations that are fantastic at supporting the rural community, taking it to the top level, I suppose, and maybe some of those officials need to be calming down a bit. And, um, of course, in, in uh, people in an office environment have often got a, a mental health first aider. And they're trained to, to recognise the signs and work with people and you'll have courses. But of course on farms that isn't something we do. And I know there's a lot of work being done by your organisation and others to try and alleviate those problems. But it is major and I'm, I'm working with a group at the moment which is trying to get, put together some podcasts to get to the root of the problem. So just work out what are our problems, so the, the working hours, our health, our stress and where it's all coming from. So farmers could listen to that, you know, at work and, and understand a little bit more about themselves and about their neighbours and about their friends to get to the root of the problem. Um, because I suspect if we went around the room, we would all know someone who has taken their own life and um, it, it's horrendous. And so it's a, it is a major problem. And, um, and we, as an industry, have got to do something about it. But I celebrate the work you do already. Um, but some great advice there. Next question, please. Oh, there's a gentleman down the front here. Oh, could you just wait for the, just wait to wait for the um, microphone? Whether you consider him a gentleman or not is irrelevant. <laughs> but I would like to. Uh, uh, Hold on. I'm um, interested to when he says that uh, he went to the bank manager. Uh, he's gone down the route that many of us have gone down. And I can tell you a little story about that. When I was about, uh, many years ago, when I was about 15, I went to the bank manager wanting money. And he said, well, young man, uh, what collateral have you got? Collateral? What the hell is this man talking about? If I got collateral, I wouldn't be here to see him. And then I thought, well, I have a push bike. <laughs> and he said, where is this uh, push bike? Uh, it's outside, parked on the side of the wall. So he jumped on the bike and uh, wobbled down the road. Now, there was a story about, have you ever seen a farmer on a bike? Well, I've seen a, a bank, manor, bank manager on a bike, and it ain't very pretty. <laughs> and the moral of this story? 
He came, <laughs> he came back in and said, you can have your hundred pound. But of course, uh, I should have realized that he, he could have been probably charged me 20%, but that was irrelevant. I wanted the money, and I wanted it the day after tomorrow to buy some ewes, uh, which I did. But uh, you say you've uh, moved into a farm in, in, I won't say an unusual route, because there's many of us have gone down that route, and still is being done today. And I could say one of the most important things that we have in farming, and I still have, is good neighbours. Very well said. Fantastic community, indeed. Thank you, sir. Uh, question in the middle, back there. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep, right. Um, it strikes me that what agricultural needs is an advertising campaign that's equal to Amazon for mental health, for food production, for, for everything, because, you know, yeah, pigs don't lay sausages, do they? But the public don't know. So you, you need some, how do I put a team together to be able to go to the likes of John Deere, Class, Bayer, things like that, and say, give us some money, an advertising budget, we can go to an advertising company and put together adverts on primetime TV, on TV, because that 30 second advert is what drums it into people's mind. You want some, you want this button, right? Amazon, because that's what you're drummed into going for. And it needs to be a high profile thing. No one's doing this. I've talked to people for years of, oh yeah, it might work, but no one's doing it. So how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I put together a team to go to these big companies and get this off the ground? I, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm, I, I don't have the answers, but I have to say, you know, you watch um, not necessarily f trying to create careers in agriculture, but trying to get the message of what we do in farming. So nano engineering, robots are milking cows, amazing machinery, incredible livestock, landscape, environment, carbon, biodiversity, you know, all this stuff we do is an, you can create an amazing picture in 30 seconds. And when you watch on the television um, an advert for someone you know, trying to encourage people to get into the Navy. Uh, it's amazing what they can show and encourage you to do. And, and I have a great respect for the military, but I wouldn't want my children to go into the military particularly. And, but, but it's incredibly tempting and, and inspiring what they show on television. So yes, why haven't we got something like that to celebrate British food um, from the big players? And should it com be coming from um, AHDB? Should it be coming from the NSA? Should it be coming from these big organisations to pull themselves together and create an advert um, that might cost them, you know, 500 grand, but it would be help the sustainability of British farming? Do, does any of the panellists have any ideas how we should do it? I think really and truly you've got to uh, rely on a business with that kind of money to put it forward um, and have the backing of a business say McDonald's or that sort of league because um, yeah we, I know we all think the same but it's just um, yeah it's, it's go straight thing. to the AHDB stand all of us <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all pay our levy don't we <laughs> it is interesting just on that so a few years ago I, I was talking to Dairy Co you know big dairy company and, um, you know, and the marketing budgets are really small, um, so you know they're, they're, you just need to. We do need to do a lot more. To yeah, you might need the microphone. He did mention it. Hmm? He did mention it. Yeah. I said the, yeah. the money needs to come from the big companies that are dependent on agriculture. Yes. The big spray companies, fertilizer companies, like that. that's where the money has to come from. But it, it does have to be, isn't it just, oh, isn't this, you know, aren't these cattle lovely, aren't these sheep lovely? It has to be, you know, this guy has got having real problems on his own because agriculture is like that. It, a 30 second bit that says, you know, death in agriculture is really phenomenal at the moment. Um, a 37 bit that says the, the um, legislation a farmer has to go do to produce this. People, people do not know these things. They simply do not know. And you get a lot more respect if you knew, if the, pub, if the public actually knew what people had to do. So, I, and I, it, I do it, think a lot of the farming 
programs on television now on all the various channels are helping a, a huge amount but people understand yeah. agriculture but you have to tune into those yeah whereas on that you know amazon have got it right they're straight in you know 30 seconds are gone you know, there's more amazon adverts on a tv in the evening than anything else mm. and that's how you have to that's how it has to be done yeah but i don't know how to do it any more questions one at the front here sorry sir here Keep missing you. Thank you. Thank you. You've mentioned social media a couple of times across the panel. Uh, there's an abundance on social media of good information about farming, but it's the same negative voices that we seem to keep coming to the top of the pile. And they're the ones that make the most noise, and they're the ones that are then starting to resonate in the minds and in the heads of people who are not directly linked to agriculture and don't know that that's just rubbish. Uh, so how do, we, how do we get the good news to be louder than the, no the background noise, and how do we do that without indulging in the old adage of wrestling with the pig and ending up messier, dirtier, and tireder than the pig in the first place and completely losing the argument? So how, how do we square that circle? I would ask a young person, actually, but um, before, before I ask a young person, I, I, I mean, I think you all need to be getting your messages out there. I mean, like, the advertising idea is really good. You're the best advert, all of you. And it's doing that thing, you know, talking to people, explaining what you're doing. So it's getting, so if you use social media, it's getting the message out about all the good stuff that, that farmers do. So, you know, 70% of the surface of this country is under agriculture use of one sort or another. That has such a powerful impact on the appearance of our countryside, on the landscape, on the environment. And that's before we even start talking about the food you all produce. So, you know, it's, it's getting that message out there. And there are always going to be people who, to be honest, they don't want to hear. And if we were talking about, say, greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, they're going to be looking at the global figures, which we know are appalling. They're not going to take any notice of the ones for the UK that are really actually not bad. And we'd be better off focusing on transport, construction and energy. And then we can turn to agriculture. You know, but it's, so it's, unfortunately, you're just going to have to keep getting those messages out. And you, I've learned you know using twitter you have to grow a thick skin very quickly because there's something about social media where that normal filter about interacting with a human just seems to go and people just go you know straight in and say some really nasty things some very ignorant things often and it can be a pretty difficult place so i suppose another thing for people's mental health is probably take a break from social media every so often because that's going to be good for you as well Anyway, a young person probably knows. I do think that a lot of the stuff that you see is the negative is um, very infactual and gossip orientated. People love a good story or a, ooh, what's that? Let's have a quick look at that. And a lot of the time it's just hooked you in. Whereas a good story, you know, nobody's really that interested, even though we, you know, we have a lot of good things to talk about. This is it, good news doesn't sell. But it's, yeah, it's those stories. I don't, it's, we just got to keep putting our own out there and doing what we can. But it's like your man was saying about the advertising, I fully agree, we can't do enough of it. We're just going to keep pushing and get our big organizations to help us and maybe get a TV ad on there. So who knows? I think we had a, quite a good example after the, this last year's Royal Welsh um, in the local paper. There was a picture of one of the big limousine bulls strutting his stuff in the main ring. And the tagline said, um, uh, you, thought you're, uh, you thought you were hot. Imagine how this boy felt. And um, it was a local paper. And the amount of comments it had, it was, it was through a social media, the amount of comments it had, the day after, they actually had to retract the post and put another post out of pictures of the cattle lying in their straw beds with fans blowing all over them. So I think it, it just needs people just to, when they see that bad or negative thing, is actually giving them the truth about it. Okay, yeah, it was hot for that bull to walk around, but actually, if you saw the crowds of people that were trying to get into those cattle pens and sheep pens because there were that many fans and it was that cool in there, you know, that's what, that was, that was the truth. That actually, those animals were actually a lot cooler than I was on Monday and Tuesday, you know, and that's where everybody wanted to be. So yeah, he was a bit hot in the ring, but he was there for 10, 15 minutes, and then he was back being hosed down, showered down in a nice cold shower, and back in his fan pen. And I think it, it proved that day, there was a couple of comments, you know, obviously people typed straight away how cruel it was, how horrible it was, but then the farmers got involved, and because they were local, like everyone from the local area got involved, recognised the animal, and said, you know, this is this is this is not true. Literally, he wasn't being dragged around. You know, he he, he did was there for ten minutes. He was back in his pen, and it took, they had that much kind of the the media company had that much abuse over it, really, that they had to go the other way and say, actually, this is the true picture. This is actually what these animals were, how they were getting treated. Um, so I do think there's a lot of work to be done when we do see this kind of thing. Instead of like 
instead of sharing it or liking it and everything, it's actually putting a comment in and trying to share the truth. I think there's a lot of, like you mentioned before about, you know, being that nice person, giving the great image, but it needs to be an honest image as well. Um, I think we, we've got self-catering accommodation at the farm and we're very open about what we're doing, you know, on the farm. If they want to come in, into the lambing shed, I'm not going to skirt around the, what happens in a lambing shed. It, it can be a brutal day sometimes, you know, and if there is something died, I'm not going to leave it there to them to see and to show it to them. But, you know, if there's a lamb with a skin on or something, I'm going to explain to them as to why that's happened, what's happened and stuff. And I think that's where it's, it's a really, really fine line. I think, like you said, I need to have a really thick skin, but I think they need the honesty as well because they appreciate that they are, you know, it is honest. We had one, one guy a few years ago come up to us um, in the lambing shed and we had a group of pet lambs, 10 of them. And uh, I think dad asked him, well, how much would you give me for these? Oh, well, oh, I'd give you about a thousand, two thousand pounds. And dad said, well, how many do you want? Where do you want them delivered to? You know, <laughs> I'll take you to them now. Only because he'd seen on the Farmer's Guardian, the, head, the headline was 10,000 guinea Texel lamb. So he just assumed that every Texel lamb in the country was worth 10,000 guineas. You know, it's things like that, that they just, it's those, it's those read it line, those headlines, and everyone sees it on the, all newspapers are really good at it, I guess. Um, but it's just like sort of, it's just getting the, the honest answer out there, the honest picture, really. Very good. The other thing is, these uh, voices on social media, I think they're big voices, but probably from a small majority. And straight away we think, oh, everyone's against us. But, well, it can be hard some days, but I'd love to know how many farmers, actual, actual proper farmers, have social media and up and down the country, because we're probably a bigger majority than we realise. Ten years ago, you hadn't heard of a vegan, but whether it's a phase or I don't know, but you, we just have to think that not everyone's against us, I don't think. Time for one more question before we wrap up. In the middle there, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm from Northern Ireland and I'm over with Ulster Farmers Union. Uh, back at home, I can only speak for there, but we're probably we're far on a much reduced scale, small farms, most farmers, um, which probably saves them are working off farm and backing up the farm income with uh, working on building sites. But it's no surprise to me that there's a crisis uh, in mental health. Um, we see, we, we, at home, we've done that much work with open farms and getting schools back out onto farms and to see how farms really work. But you ask, if, you ask a school child in Northern Ireland who's the strong in the universe, They'll be well fit to tell you that agriculture is destroying the universe, in my opinion. But, but farmers just generally feel totally under pressure. I see innovative and forward going farmers putting the brakes on young farmers who just who would have thought of coming into farming 10 years ago have no interest in going to farming now because it's stagnant. It's portrayed as, as I said, the, the ruination of the earth. And um, when we go to meet supermarkets, you know, it's you're doing great, guys, but here's the real, here's the new hoops you have to jump through, you know, continually jump through, jump through, and this is what our consumers want. When I go out to shop with my wife, I do not see consumers asking them to lift this off the shelf and that it's a shelf, what's the carbon footprint of this? It's at the back of our mind continually, and we are investing and looking after the environment from I was young, and that's the beauty of the countryside, both here and in Northern Ireland. But I really wonder, are we just being used as gimmicks, and continual gimmicks from one food retailer to the other, and where is it going to stop? Thank you very much. Um, the a very interesting comment. I don't think we, we have, it wasn't necessarily a question, more of a statement, but um, just to wrap up, what I'd, I'd like to do is, is just end on a positive note. And we have all those challenges, so, and I totally agree that, that that is happening and that is out there and we do need to be concerned about it. But let's not forget the reason we started this conversation was to celebrate the importance of British agriculture to the rural domain what we do socially, what we do environmentally, and what we do financially. And that is absolutely essential that our government realise that and they support us in the right way, but most importantly, the public sector and the consumer support us. And the only way we can gain that support is to gain their trust that we already have to a certain degree. We've just got to keep those messages going out there 
and it's particularly about education in our mind, and we've heard from the panelists today. It's about the young people who are the parents of the future to understand where their food comes from, how it's been produced, the energy and effort that's gone into that, so they can make the right informed choices and support agriculture going forward. And us as an industry, we already are, and there's an awful lot going on, and we've got some great people. Um, we just need to do more and keep pushing forward and trying to remain as, as positive as possible. And if you are in a situation that you're feeling down in the dumps, there are some amazing charities to reach out to, but don't forget your friends and families. Uh, look after each other and care for one another. Um, we have got to be here for the long term.